Okay, um, I'll just open us in prayer and then we can begin. Father, we thank you for this new week. We thank you, Lord, for uh, leading and guiding us through all that we have been uh, doing, uh, Lord, through uh, the weekend and the past week, we thank you uh, that you are our teacher, that you are the one who gives us wisdom and understanding, Lord, uh, to comprehend uh, things that are so much higher than our human minds can comprehend. And so even as we uh, begin this class today, we pray, uh, Lord, that you would inspire our hearts to believe you for greater things, that um, as we hear the stories of people whom you have used, Lord, uh, you would stir within our hearts a uh, desire for more of you. Uh, we pray, um, Lord, that you would move in power. We pray for lovely as she presents your blessings over her, Lord, and uh, for each one of us gathered here to receive from you what you desire to uh, impart to us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'll be presenting or may rather narrating a story about John Chilik. So I thought, um, let me do it a little different. I didn't prepare any presentation as such, but I have a I hope my uh, audio is fine. Yes, uh, let me just mute it. I think that maybe. Uh, now? Um, yeah, okay. So I just have one slide that I would like you to see. Then I'll start my presentation. I mean, let's Okay. I think you can see my. I hope you can see my screen because I can't see you. Um, so I'm assuming you can see my screen. I'll uh, stop sharing in a bit. Uh, so today I would like to present about uh, John G. Lake. So I would want you to see how he looks. That's the reason I have uh, put up this slide. And starting with one of uh, the quote that he believed in, uh, do not imprison Christ in you. Let him live, let him manifest himself, let him find went through you. Uh, so I would rather introduce this person. Uh, many, of, many of them introduce this person as a man of healing. And he's one of the, one of the fathers of faith that we would uh, really inspired uh, inspired me in a many different ways and have heard about him read about him through many years now and a uh, little bit of background about john g lake uh, he was born uh, in ontario canada he's a canadian around 1870 he was born and he, he has a very very big family uh, so he has a lot of siblings and his parents were believers and uh, methodists at that point of time and they were very spiritual in nature as well but they have uh, you know uh, i'm not sharing anything at all uh thank you so to begin this story with the birth of john gilek is in 1870 in canada and he has a huge family and uh, all the family members has seen a lot of sicknesses and deaths throughout the years. He lost uh, many of his siblings due to uh, sickness and death, which created a lot of despair and uh, distress in himself. And where, when he was, uh, you know, very young, he had a uh, he had a condition or a disease where he couldn't walk. And uh, when due to uh, during that time, Alexander Dobie, we already we heard about him and we uh, read about him in our last class, who is a healing evangelist at that point of time when he uh, they approached him and when he prayed or uh, prayed for John G. Lake and he was revived and he could walk again. Same thing happened with his sister when she was on his death uh, bed and all she died. Then they call Alexander for prayer and he said, you know, do not be afraid she will live. God will uh, revive her. And it happened. So this created a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, 
enthusiasm in John Gillick to see the God's power uh, practical and literally in his life. Over the period of time, uh, he joined the Methodist Church, and when he is married to his wife, uh, he was. Uh, and his wife was also in the similar position of a deathbed situation. Uh, and Alexander Dowie uh, prayed upon her and she was revived again. Uh, then this revelation stuck to John Gillick about who is causing the death, who is causing the sickness, that is Satan and not God. When that really stuck John Gillick, it is like a lightning of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jesus that, he could see Jesus Christ being, you know, uh, anointing him and anointing him with kind of a revelation of where the devil is being revealed and the Jesus is being like, you know, uh, being the light of what uh, darkness that he has been under throughout these years. And when he was asking God of like, you know, I wanted to be uh, baptized with the Holy Ghost after uh, after listening to uh, the many teachings uh, he would say that you talk about the old age from heaven and the power of god why there is lightning in the soul of jesus the lightning of jesus heal men by their flash sin dissolves and the disease flees when the power of god approaches so lake would also compare the anointing of god's spirit to the power of electricity like just as man had learned the laws of electricity lake you know, discovered the loss of the spirit. And as God's lightning rod, he would rise within God's calling to electrify uh, the powers of darkness and solidify the body of Christ. So for him, it started with beginning uh, strengthening his spiritual, you know, uh, strengthen his spiritual uh, understanding of who is Holy Spirit and what Holy Spirit can do. Uh, in his words, it says that, you know, it became easy for him to detach uh, himself from the course of life so that while my hands and mind were engaged in the common affairs of every day, my spirit maintained its attitude of communion with God. So you, uh, John Gilleg was not uh, did not start his life as a minister. He was not uh, ministering, uh, but he was a businessman and he was into real estate and uh, he was a quite successful businessman at that point of time because he's the one who believed that he can also pursue God and also, you know, he can also do a secular job and he can be the salt and light in both the worlds as well. So I think this is similar we see in our uh, church setting as well. This some one of the principles that uh, we follow as a, a church. So once, once John G. Lake reached to this point, when he felt that God is calling him to, uh, you know, step into the ministry, he actually sold all of his assets, having nothing to him. And when God told him to move to Africa at that point of time, uh, he was he, he was. Uh, having zero rupees in his hand and he has a family and one of his friends to accompany uh, with him to Africa. This is one of the wonderful stories where um, he was praying. It was always mentioned the material, how much of a material I have been referred, studied and researched about him. It was mentioned a couple of times that when he prayed in his secret closet, God has answered him. When he prayed uh, that he needs that my $2,000, uh, some random person sent some four, four, five hundred dollars draft to him in order sufficient for his African trip. And when he arrived in Africa, God took care of his needs uh, amazingly. And it was uh, mentioned that they have seen uh, um, a huge amount of healings happening, miracles happening, people being saved in Africa. And, and it was uh, an amazing one decade that uh, he was there. It was a powerful, powerful. Uh, ministry that God has uh, given to John G. Lake. Throughout this, the one fascinating thing I would uh, really say, highlight is, uh, he always says, it's not about the manifestations, but it's about always, it's always about his close walk with God. When he, his close walk with God resulted in what God has called him to do. And it really fascinated, even though he's seeing such a huge ministry and such a thing is happening, uh, but he still uh, sticks to the, what is the root of it? Sticks to what is his 
a uh, main purpose of having that close walk and communion with god even though he was trained a little bit under alexander doing his early years but after learning about what is happening with his lifestyle he detached himself from those kind of ministries and he has uh, become an individual evangelist where he traveled to africa and in during his time in africa there were a lot of people used to wait at his home like you know a day and night thousands and thousands of people to wait to see that you know uh, he would come he would come and he would uh, really uh, touch them and they will be experiencing his healing power i mean and he always maintain i mean uh, make sure that he has directed people to god not to himself that is that is one of the uh, fascinating thing about john g lake even through his ministry he never said no to anybody who came for prayer and he went through any difficult situations he never stood stood back but because he always believed when you put your faith in the word of god and you act upon it god will be doing his work there is no other way that you you know uh, come back after his uh, after his uh, ministry in africa unfortunately he loses his wife uh, due to a heart attack and then he comes to a spokesman uh, where they have uh started the healing rooms uh, where uh healing and people whom he trained are called healing technicians and it is such a technical word at that point of time itself uh, where people used to come to this healing rooms and they used to be prayed for and he, the people who did not get the healing immediately they used to stay there and people used to pray and read the word confess the word to them continuously and until they get healed they used to stay and then go back so here we see two techniques that he used he believed in instant uh, you know the immediate healing of jesus christ also the process that or may be involved in for many other reasons as well so uh, due to due to uh, john g lake the particular city in the us was considered as the most healthiest city because of uh, the power of the christ being displayed to uh, john g lake that's why he is called a man of healing um, going forward the story uh, goes where the it really caught the attention of the press attention of everybody around the uh, around the areas and they used to come and really inspect that if if this is a bluff or is really the healings are happening so john g lake was not afraid to confess his faith at any point of time uh, he was not uh, he was very bold enough to say that you can come and check whomever you want you bring your lawyers you bring your doctors you bring your press reporters everybody they had a committee made and he said i'm going to give you 100 people who got healed and you can you can take a testimony from them and when they really uh, spoke to two people they were like uh, not required anymore we believe it and it was printed and the you know distributed in every every part of the country of us at that point of time and uh, this healing rooms also continued and were later john g lake uh, um, married to another person and they had a, a good life and uh, children all of that and he uh, wanted people to learn uh, you know how to uh, how to minister in healing that's why he used to train the people uh in the word of god and how he used to minister and uh, those are also called the healing technicians and all throughout his life he has only depended on one thing who is holy spirit and in absolute surrender to god and his close walk with god these three things that he never left one of the main uh, regrets we would i mean he would say that you know uh, because of his completely involvement in ministry um he he was you know not able to give uh, enough proper attention to his first family and which led uh, you know there is some kind of a grief that he carried when his uh, wife passed away because of malnutrition because she has to continuously uh, you know supply food for everybody she comes with the limited resources she has and so much of physical exhaustion so he would say that if one thing i could uh, really do it that i wanted to be for my kids and for my wife that he rectified when he got married again uh, to another person uh, he made made sure that he always been around his family and he gave that a uh, priority uh, to his family um, when you see his life i would say you cannot really point out uh, you know this went wrong with him and it was such a surprising thing apart from the family situation that he 
uh, you know, uh, that he faced and he rectified, realized and rectified in the coming years, uh, we could not say, okay, there is a fall that happened for John Chilek. He was consistent in his ministry. He was consistent uh, in his uh, walk with God, and he was a man of integrity. He was a man of word, and he was a man of faith. So when we look at him, and I always get inspired so much, like if God could do through a person like John G. Lake, uh, you know, because just because he believed in the word of God and he asked God for his anointing, he didn't go out by himself doing something, but he asked God for his anointing. One of his prayer was, God, if you will baptize me in the Holy Ghost and give me the power of God, nothing shall be permitted to stand between me and 100-fold obedience. It, it is such a, a statement that, you know, obedience, we read in scripture, like obedience is greater than sacrifice, which he he found out the right uh, interpretation and he, in, in fact, he actually followed it. So on and overall, I think my times, uh, we, we came to the, I want to summarize it like uh, John Gillick is a person of obedience to God. He's a person of integrity and character that who completely dependent on God. He might made uh, some mistakes, but he never uh, never let himself down but he came back he realized his mistakes and he worked upon it and he had a, a almost a four or five decades of a, a ministry altogether he pastored several churches he is an apostle who uh, who has uh, you know uh, who has established many churches over all the parts of us and he is a person who believes that if you have faith in the word of God and the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that God will be, uh, you know, displayed through you. And he always believed in, uh, you know, exposing God as his glorious triumphant, not just, uh, a, not just an invisible God, but a visible God who can do works through uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's about John G. Lake. Uh, if you have any questions or you want more information, you can always, you know, ask me. And you should also read uh, uh, read about him in a much detailed way. Uh, there is a lot of information and uh, it's very, very inspiring. I always feel, oh, if God could do through him. Uh, and it is very similar because we also work, we also do ministry, we also are, uh, you know, uh, desiring the same things that God would work through us as well. So yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, lovely. Um, yeah, even as I've been preparing for class, I think there's so much more that you can study about each of these um, each of these revivalists and each of their stories is so powerful. Um, so if you all have the opportunity to read more apart from what we're covering in class, because that's obviously limited by time. Um, it, yeah, it would be really good for you to go back and do more study. So we will continue from where we stopped last week. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so um, we had stopped last week. We, I mean, we covered a lot in last week's class. Uh, so right up to 1934, uh, where we ended with uh, the Wycliffe uh, Bible translation. Um, so William Cameron Townsend, who had started that. Um, so 1949, uh, we read about a revival in the Hebrides Islands. Um, so at that point of time, uh, in the Hebrides Islands specifically, um, I'll just quickly switch to the next slide so you know where it is. So that's uh, England, um, Scotland, and above that, there's this group of islands called the Hebrides Islands. 
so the revival happened there. It's a very tiny, tiny place, uh, but God still moves in the tiny places. <laughs> Praise God. So, um, yes. So in the mid 1900s, um, the church had come to a place of spiritual dryness. And so we see that being the state oftentimes before uh, people begin to pray for revival and recognize that they need a move of God. Um, so at this point, there were no young people attending church. Um, and there were these two sisters, which you see in the picture, uh, on either side of... Uh, so the in between is an evangelist named Duncan Campbell, who was also used in the revival. And on either side of him is uh, Peggy and Christine Smith. Uh, so they were two very elderly ladies. Uh, Peggy Smith uh, was 84 years old and blind. And Christine Smith was 82 years old and um, had uh, was suffering from arthritis. So uh, they had very good reasons to just relax uh, for the rest of their lives. But... Uh, they began to have a burden to pray for the church and to pray for revival within the church. Um, and God gave them a vision that he was going to send revival, um, specifically through this verse in Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Uh, so with that, having that vision, they went and spoke to the pastor of their church. And um, and he also like encouraged them and they started praying three times a week from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Um, so people would gather in different places. Peggy and Christine would uh, pray in their home. Uh, people would meet in different places and pray for three days a week, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Uh, as they were praying, uh, one night, uh, suddenly God just began to move powerfully. And uh, around 3 a.m., there were 600 people who gathered at the church. Uh, these were people who were in bed at the time, and they suddenly got woken up, got dressed, and went to church. They didn't understand fully what they were doing or why they were doing it, uh, but they just felt drawn to go to the church. Uh, and from that time on, people started to arrive at the island uh, from different parts, taking buses and coming to the island without anyone saying anything. No one told them anything about anything that's happening. It was just the presence of God that was drawing them uh, to this place. Um, so um, as, um, as people started to gather for this prayer, um, Peggy and uh, her sister again had a vision about an evangelist who was coming, who would come in from outside and preach in the church. And so they again shared this with their pastor. And he invited uh, Duncan Campbell, who was an evangelist, uh, conducting um, meetings in a different island at that time. He sent out an invitation to him, and he said, I'm right in the middle of evangelistic meetings in these islands, so I'm not going to be able to come. Um, but the sister said, if God has revealed it, uh, he, will, he will come. He, God will work it out. And so within 10 days, Duncan Campbell ended up at Hebrides Islands because his evangelistic meetings got canceled uh, where he was. Um, and God used him uh, powerfully in this time. Uh, so the first night that he arrived, uh, they took him straight to the church and he was preaching there and nothing significant happened. People were there uh, for an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, they listened to him preach and they went home. After he left, uh, there was a young person in the church who just felt that they should pray. And uh, throughout this time of praying for revival, um, they had been praying that verse from Isaiah 44 uh, because God had given them that verse. So he stood there in the middle of the aisle and he began to pray. He uh, prayed that verse. And within 15 minutes, uh, they saw crowds of people who had arrived at the church. Um, just after they had closed the service. So there were people who had gathered uh, from all over the place. Uh, there was uh, actually a story of 
uh, 100 people who had gathered at a, they were at a party and uh, right in the middle of the party god just convicted them and felt they all felt that they need to go to church so from the party they all left and arrived at the church um so uh, they then conducted a meeting for all these people who arrived so from 11 pm that night till 4 am uh, these people were ministered to and as he was leaving this meeting and going back to his hotel room at 4 p uh, 4 am uh, someone called him to the police station because people had gathered there at the police station uh, some 300 people had gathered uh, and they were all just like they also didn't like fully understand why they were there um, but they all felt the draw of God to come there and so he went to the um, to the police station and preached and ministered to them. Um, so during this time, there were God was moving uh, supernaturally. So people would uh, fall into trances. They would uh, weep, repent over sin. Um, there was uh, God was moving through the neighboring towns, through uh, that um, that town of Lewis itself, where the revival started. Um, there's one story from 1957 to 1958 where four there were four girls in their early 20s. Uh, God used them powerfully. They actually uh, ministered to people who were um, in pubs and they became famous for emptying pubs on the island because of their ministry. Uh, so there was so much of God moving without anyone kind of publicizing it. So all of these stories of people just gathering at the police station, people gathering at the church, no one had said anything. It was just the presence of God that was drawing people. Uh, and from here, it started, uh, it spread out of uh, this island to other towns, to other countries as well. Um, we move on from here to, OK, so this was, sorry, I didn't change slide, but um, yeah some of the things we covered. Uh, 1952, uh, Jim Elliott um, was a missionary to South America. So he was very young when he went out as a missionary. Uh, and he was joined by Pete Fleming. Um, he worked three years with a group of people called the Kichwas. Uh, and after three years, uh, he and a group of, uh, so a group of five people, uh, moved to start to minister to another tribe called the Aukas. And just six days after making contact with this group, all of them were killed. So um, it was a tribal group, right? So anyone who came from the outside were viewed as uh, people who were, were endangering them. And so uh, they killed them. But uh, just one quote from him, missionaries are very human folks just doing what they are asked. Simply a bunch of nobodies trying to exalt somebody. Um, so he died um, um, at a very young age. He was 27 when he died. Uh, but even in that short time, uh, he inspired many, many people because um, he was a young person who was passionate for God and went out uh, by himself to uh, answer God's call. Um, 1965 to 1975, this was a revival that started uh, among the hippies. Um, so during that time, it uh, became quite common in the Western culture for young people uh, to uh, get into the hippie movement and uh, what was part of the hippie movement was rebellion against uh, authority so all kinds of authority whether it was government or church or whatever uh, rebel against authority uh, lots of them were into drugs alcohol free sex eastern mysticism communal living so uh, they were living together in community and all of this was being practiced as a community uh, okay, so um, practicing, so Eastern mysticism was a lot of um, the what we see uh, on meditation, a lot of the occult, uh, all of those things were being practiced uh, within this group of people. Uh, they were also viewed by society as um, rejects, as losers, as people 
who were just kind of taking an easy way out from life. They were avoiding responsibility because it was all young people. So they were viewed as young people who didn't want to take responsibility, who had just kind of taken an easy way uh, out of doing anything important with their lives. Um, during this time, um, Charles Smith, also known as Chuck Smith, uh, started to minister to hippies in Costa Mesa, California, along with his wife, Kay Smith. Um, and he is considered one of the most influential figures in modern American Christianity because uh, he reached out to these group, this big, large group of people who were like completely rejected by society, but in doing that, uh, transformed a lot of Christian culture itself. Uh, because these people had such a huge impact on Christian culture uh, when they came to Christ. Um, and we look at how they had that impact. Uh, so some of the ways that uh, people reached out to them was uh, they started coffee shops. So through coffee shops, they started to minister to these young people. Uh, and they also started a Christian version. So because they had this communal living, uh, they also had a Christian communal living um uh, center so where people who were coming out of drugs were coming out of this movement had a place to stay and they were being ministered to so it was called the living room um, many hundreds of hippies started to give up drugs give up all of the things that they were practicing uh, and turning to jesus and starting to share that with others uh, so Apart from Chuck Smith, another very important person that was used uh, was one of the uh, first converts from the hippie movement. His name was Lonnie Frisbee. Uh, so he was part of the group that started this living room movement. Um, and uh, he was very, very powerful in evangelistic work that was done among the hippies. Um, so this started to be called the Jesus Movement. Also, they were called the Jesus People or Jesus Freaks. Um, I don't know if you've heard the song um, Jesus Freak, but all of that is coming out of this movement. Uh, it's by a band called DC Talk. Uh, OK, let me try and change slide. OK, so these are some of the um, things that happened because of this group of people. Um, so as they became, uh, as they kind of uh, started following Jesus, the uh, spread of um, this conversion impacted parts of North, North America, Europe, Central America. Uh, so right up to the 1970s, people uh, from the 60s to the 70s, uh, this revival was spreading across these parts of the Western world. Um, and different churches that were really impacted uh, are listed here, Calvary Chapel Church, Hope Chapel Church, Vineyard Church, um, Fellowship House Church, Shiloh Youth Revival Center. So lots of churches that are well known today actually were impacted by this movement. Um, a lot of contemporary Christian music started during this time because uh, these young people were so into music that when they came to Christ, uh, music came out of that, right? So the Maranatha singers, Hillsong, Jesus Culture, all of these uh, are products of this revival. Um, the use of guitar and drums, um, dancing in the spirit, the use of choruses. So before this, there were mostly hymns within the church, but using uh, more uh, contemporary music, all of that came out of this time. And then some bands uh, that came out of this were Petra, Keith Green, Andre Crouch, uh, Barry Maguire, Philly, Phil Kigi. Uh, so lots of the music, I don't know how many of you are familiar with all of this, but definitely in my generation, all of this was very... Uh, very, very popular. Uh, so all of this came out of this, the Jesus movement, and then impacted uh, contemporary music for us today within the church. Um, 
so even though by the late 1980s the movement itself uh, didn't continue with the same kind of power that it had uh, had it had a huge impact on the church as a whole on christian worship uh, and on how uh, how the church continues to worship today okay my mouse is a little okay. Uh, here we move to the 1970 Asbury College Revival. Uh, so very recently also we were talking about revival at Asbury College. Um, so there is a history of revival that has happened in Asbury. Uh, so we have a few years here, 1905, 1950, 1958. Uh, we are looking at 1970 and then more recently, um, 2000. Was it 2022? It wasn't 22, right? Oh, so 23. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, um, so that's been a place that God has just chosen to use to take revival into other parts of the world. Um, in the 1970 revival. Um, Asbury is a Christian college, so there are regular chapels that happen uh, from Monday to uh, Friday, like uh, supernatural hours here. Um, and so uh, this was part of their regular chapel service. As they gathered for service, uh, their dean of the school was supposed to share, but he felt at that time that he should invite students to come and share their testimonies. And so, uh, when he invited uh, them, there was a like a long line of students that gathered, and they all came in turn sharing for revival. Um, already, there had been preparation for revival, so there had been prayer happening on campus for revival to happen. So they were already in this place of expectation for God to move, uh, and so uh, this invitation for people to come and share was something that was already had been prepared for in prayer and so as they came and started sharing uh, one of the students came up uh, was a third year student who shared um, about his own personal life he said uh, i feel like until now i have not been fully um, i have not given my life fully to christ i have not like fully been for jesus and i want to make that commitment now and then he invited other students who wanted to make that commitment to also come to the altar and it was at that time that people like a large group of students started to move towards the altar and people started to weep to repent to confess their sins um, it was a very student led revival meaning that it was the move of god among the students itself not uh, something that was led by the administration. Uh, and uh, some of the ways that they described this uh, was that as if God himself had walked into the room at that point. People didn't want to leave the chapel at all. Uh, there, it's a 1,500-seater uh, auditorium and was packed uh, for the next eight days and eight nights continuously, there was worship happening in the hall. Uh, so people were coming up and sharing their testimonies and people were praying. Um, classes were canceled for that week. Uh, and even after that, the hall was left open uh, for people to come and share their testimonies. Uh, from the college, there were hundreds of uh, students who traveled to other campuses, traveled to churches, telling them about what was happening here. And wherever they went, uh, revival would happen on those college campuses and in those churches. And was not, um, it was not through any powerful preaching. It was just students sharing their own testimony of what they had experienced, what they had seen on their campus. Um, in fact, um, uh, someone was sharing from Asbury that it seemed that the more uh, normal the student was, the student who was least known among the college at that time, those were the kinds of students that God was using to spark the revival in other places. Um, so from here it spread, it's recorded to have spread to 130 other colleges, seminaries, Bible schools, and churches in the U.S. Um, and it spread from New York to California. So that's the 
East Coast to the West Coast, and then even to South America. Can somebody just check on time for me because I don't have my 43? OK, just let me know when we are done. Um, OK, so 1980, uh, looking at a revival in Argentina, um, so there was uh, one man named Carlos Anacondia, who was a businessman, uh, but he had gone, uh, he had become an evangelist uh, who God used powerfully through this time. Um, as he was preaching, thousands of people would accept Christ. There were signs, wonders, healings, deliverances. Um, so Argentina actually has experienced many revivals. The first was in 1949. Um, then there was another one in 1954. Um, and then this one in 1980. So during this revival, um, there was a lot of occultic practice that was happening uh, in the culture at that time. And there was a lot of demonic activity. So this picture that you see here uh, is actually them ministering to someone who uh, this became a normal part of these uh, revival meetings. So uh, when this when Carlos was preaching, before he preached a sermon, he would speak directly to uh, the demons and uh, command them not to disrupt the meetings, because that was very common, where uh, there would be demonic disruptions to the meetings. So he would command them not to disrupt, uh, and that the gospel would be able to be preached clearly to the people. Um, he would then preach the gospel, and then he would again minister to those who were under any kind of demonic uh, uh, oppression. Uh, during this time, there was so much demonic activity that there would be, they had a separate room, a separate space where anyone who uh, was manifesting in any way, showing any signs of being, um, being demonized or being uh, possessed, they would take them to the separate place and people would be ministering to them there, uh, two people ministering to one person. So uh, there was a lot of deliverance that happened through this revival in Argentina. Go from here. Uh, so now we move into 1982 present day. And uh, what has happened from the 1980s onwards is that uh, we've seen a lot of uh, mega churches. So. Uh, churches that are growing powerfully, not just attracting people with uh, things that are um, worldly, but attracting people through preaching of the word, through demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so there's been a huge growth in churches since this time. Oh, sorry. I think, did my, is this slide show? Okay, I'll just share again. So. Um, here we see one of the largest churches that's still one of the largest churches today um, in the world. Um, so this is uh, in uh, Korea, in South Korea, uh, and is led by Pastor Yonggi Cho. It's called the Yoida Full Gospel Church. Uh, in Seoul, Korea. Um, so this church was, a, uh, in 1928, there was a lady named Mary C. Ramsey. So she was baptized in the spirit at Azusa Street, and then she moved to Korea, and she started the first Pentecostal church in 1928. In 1958 is when Yonggi Cho started um, this church, the Yoida uh, Full Gospel Church in Seoul's, uh, in a slum there. And uh, when he started it, there were five people who gathered for the first meeting. Uh, but by 2023 now, there are nearly 900,000 members uh, within the church. Uh, and within the whole of South Korea, there's been a huge growth of 
um, Pentecostal churches specifically. And uh, the main contributors to these churches growing is uh, prayer um, and is uh, also the teaching of the word. Um, there's healing, there's miracles, there's dependence on the Holy Spirit. And within this church specifically, uh, a use of cell groups. So they, there's a huge um, kind of a very big importance given to cell groups. Uh, so it's through these cell groups that people are discipled and people are growing. And so they see that as very key to the growth of the church. And then the use of um, mass media as well has been very key in the growth of the church. So this is one of the largest churches in the world. Um, in our book, we have two other churches mentioned, which we we'll look at later. Uh, but there's also another church in Nigeria that more recently has grown and is now considered one of the largest churches, uh, the top three churches in the world. Um, it's called the Living Faith Church, also known as Winner's Chapel. Um, it has thousands of branches spread across the African continent and beyond. Uh, the church has a, over 5 million members in total. That is all these different uh, branches together, uh, founded by Bishop David Oyedepo and uh, situated in the city of Lagos, uh, Nigeria. So the main campus seats 50,000 people, but weekly attendance is 200,000. Um, and the church will soon be building another building which is larger so they can seat more people. Um, 19, we'll go. Okay, are we at closing time or? Yeah, okay, we'll continue tomorrow then. Um, from where we stopped, so 1983. Thank you all, we'll see you tomorrow.